learning never stops. You have to keep learning. You can't say I mastered this or that. The minute you stop, you know there's something wrong. Hi, welcome to English with Ray. Today on the podcast, we're joined with Jack from Plus British English. Now, Jack produces some excellent content and as evidence of how great his content is, it's massively, massively popular. And he only started making this content very recently. And when you hear Jack speak, you'll be surprised to find out that English isn't actually his first language. He is self-taught in English, which makes his level of proficiency just so uh, impressive. Um, he's gone on to achieve a degree in the English language. So if you want to learn about challenges of learning a language and how to overcome them, Jack is a great testament to that. And I think you will benefit a lot from the knowledge he shares in this video. We discuss the challenges he faced in his own journey and challenges which are common to other English learners. Now, Jack's content is primarily aimed at Arab speakers, but I think regardless of what your background is, there will definitely be knowledge to which you can benefit from. Anyway, without further rambling on, let's just get started in the episode and I'm sure you'll enjoy this one. My brother, thank you so much for joining me and coming on my podcast today. It's a pleasure. Thank you very much for having me. So I was just shocked to find out because I've been watching your videos. Your videos are like and kind of aimed at Arabic learners trying to learn English. Uh, you have a large base of followers who are benefiting from your videos. And I told you I have been improving my Arabic by watching your videos. They're aimed at Arabs trying to learn English, but I've been using it as a um, as an English speaker trying to learn Arabic. So um yeah, how did you get started in the whole journey of video making and, uh, I guess, coaching languages? Right. So a bit of background. I graduated uh, with a degree in English language and literature back in 2012 uh, in Syria. However, I never got to kind of, you know, practice because of the conflict at that time. So I was forced to leave. And, you know, this some, something remained with me, like I've changed jobs and I've, I've got out of the country. And this is a very long story, but how I got into kind of video kind of content creating was um, exactly in late, late 20, uh, 20 last year, um, I was sort of um, got some time, you know, some free time, extra time, you know, on my hand because I was not commuting to London. And I, I, I wanted to kind of do something. I've never done this before. As I said, over the past six or seven years, I've never got into teaching because I would do something completely different. Mm -hmm. And with this free time, you know, um, uh, in my hand, I, I decided, okay, why don't I just start a YouTube channel? So I started my YouTube channel, but I also realized like with YouTube, you can also do other stuff because you can repurpose the same content. So I said, okay, I'll go to do the same thing for my TikTok. I do the same thing for my uh, Instagram. And it started with, with a very basic idea, like, you know, maybe helping some friends and some people that I knew because uh, mm -hmm. uh, I've had some people reaching out and said, like, you know, I'd like to learn, I'd like to improve my language. It's okay, I'll start doing something. And this is where the whole idea started, literally less than a year. And, uh, and, and today, you know, sort of kind of uh, grew, uh, which, is, which is something, to be honest, I did not expect. Yeah, well, that's incredible because <laughs> you don't have a small following. I think, well, on Instagram, you have more than 200,000 followers. YouTube, there's like 50,000 followers. And um, uh, what well, on TikTok, was it like 300 or 400,000 followers, something like that? So, yeah, something like that. So the most, the most up-to-date figures from yesterday, I think it was over 50 on YouTube, 50,000 uh -huh. uh, followers uh -huh. on YouTube. And I've got 270, over 270,000 uh, uh -huh. followers on Instagram and around wow. 440,000 wow. on TikTok, which is, which is incredible. So I need to ask you, like, considering you were not taking this really seriously, you're just kind of dipping your toes in the pool. 
and you became famous. <laughs> what what was that like? Um, you know, because like, what? How long has COVID been? A year, two years? It's not it's not long. You know, how was it to you know step in this and then all of a sudden for your popularity to blow up the way it has? I think for me it kind of caught me by surprise. Of course, because as I said, it takes some time. It takes some effort to for you to go and plan and, and mm -hmm. record and you know yeah. edit and then post and comment and, and engage with with uh, with your followers. Uh, but I have to say it's been quite interesting because, mm -hmm. you know, you think yourself, you know, quite a lot of things about language until you really start planning mm -hmm. and actually delivering. And that's the time you really realize how how challenging it can be, how how you know that like the responsibility that you've got you know the responsibility to go to do your homework do your research of course but also the importance of being uh, authentic of being genuine mm -hmm. you know um um and also which is also the, the other part is it is not easy to keep you know kind of the same kind of level constantly uploading constantly trying to engage and responding to almost every single comment which sometimes takes me my entire evenings because wow. i do my best to be respectful and try to respond to people <laughs> but sometimes that is not possible i can imagine it must be overwhelming um i gotta ask you from syria right so english is probably your second language English is my third language. Third language, so, wow. Yes, my Amazing. mother tongue is uh -huh. Kurdish. Okay. But having been born and, you know, raised in Syria, Arabic is also my, my I was considered my mother tongue, but also it's my second language. Mm -hmm. Although it's, it's, I would say it's my first language as well. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I English is my second slash third language. Wow. So um, how did you go about learning English? When did that journey start? This is a very, you know, my, my passion, my love mm -hmm. uh, for language has been there for, for a very long time. I remember when I was a kid, I used to, you know, we used to kind of, uh, my dad used to listen to uh, uh, BBC radio uh, in Arabic that used to know, and it's still broadcasting, you know, uh, in the Middle East. And they'll always say, you know, BBC from London, BBC from London. And from mm -hmm. a very young age, you know, I kind of used to listen to the BBC. And then when I sort of became, kind of got into my, my mm -hmm. uh, intermediate school, I started like watching CNN, like news and also BBC. And from that time, I think around, the seventh or the, the eighth grade, I started kind of developed a passion for language. And this is where I started like kind of reading, you know, short stories in English, listening sure. to podcasts, uh, not was kind of listening to music basically in, uh, uh, in English, uh, watching American uh, uh, films. And this is where, you know, the more I watch, the more I listen, the more kind of I read, the more kind of, uh, you know, my passion grew. Uh, uh, for mm -hmm. this language. Uh, so what kind of age were you when you um, started the journey of learning English? So I would say that I was around the age of 15 or 16. Okay. okay. And what were some of the hardest parts for you about learning English? Oh, that's a very interesting question. I think when you are learning a language, there I mean, a, a significant challenge for me at the beginning uh, was not having someone who speaks the language. So, you know, I was living in a community where, where for example, Arabic or Kurdish was the dominant language. So I tried, one of the things that I found uh, really challenging at the beginning was I've learned quite a lot of <clears throat> vocabulary. So I used to have, mm -hmm an Oxford like dictionary, like bucket dictionary, literally mm -hmm. in my pocket. So wherever I go, like if I go from point A to point B, maybe a half an hour walk, I would take that dictionary with me all the way, you mm -hmm. know, and we'd be kind of learning words, 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 like vocabulary. And at some point, you know, I've had a good base of vocabulary. 
And the challenge was I was unable to kind of, you know, kind of structure a meaningful sentence. Mm-hmm. And after some time, I realized that, you know, you can have, you can memorize maybe half, you know, or a big kind of number of vocabulary. Mm-hmm. But if you do not know how to meaningfully put together a sentence, that's not going to make a lot of sense. That's not going to be helpful. So I think the main challenge for me at that time was, uh, you know, not sort of having the knowledge of kind of mm-hmm. not being aware of the importance of building a sentence. But also the other challenge was sort of the grammar. The English grammar was quite challenging at the beginning. Sure. Uh-huh. So um, quite complex, you know, um, try to really get my head around it. Uh, at that time, there was no internet, there was no YouTube, there were no podcasts. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, you have to go, you have to buy DVDs <clears throat> or CDs at that time, or you have to mm-hmm. go, you know, buy, buy books, or you have to go listen to the radio. And um, it was a bit of a challenge until I, I, I managed to get hold of a couple of books that helped me with my grammar. And then I realized after that, that the challenge was uh pronunciation sure so you know um pronunciation you you can speak the language if you also you can get you know you can work on your grammar but also a key part of that was you need also to have sort of you know a a good pronunciation Mm -hmm. i'm not saying that it's it's like you know it's a must have i need to have like a perfect pronunciation Mm -hmm. but still it was quite important for example just to give you an example, um, you know, in the Arabic language, for example, the the sound p, p yeah. does not exist. Yeah. For example, um, I would come across some friends, for example, would say, let's go, you know, um, um, like, you know, like go to the body, <laughs> you know, body. Yeah, I like, see this with my students a lot, the letter ba. Exactly, you know, uh-huh. and instead of party or, you know, when people will see like, you know, uh, let's go to the park and instead of going to the park. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, what park? No, uh-huh. you know, it's stuff like that. Um, and also like, so it takes a bit of time for you to kind mm. of master kind of the pronunciation, which at a later stage, I realized that, you know, it's really, <clears throat> this is after I moved to the UK that mm. you realize there are dozens, maybe tens of different dialects and accents throughout you know uh, the united kingdom yeah or sure. even like in the, in the english speaking world that you really do not have to worry about having a perfect accent or, or dialect i mean if you move to london like i moved to london and the the kind of the number of dialects and the accent that you encounter on daily basis is something incredible of course of course it's funny because like uh, i teach on Prepley. And on my account, it has the um, the Union Jack. So people think, oh, this guy's from the UK. And a lot of these students, they see the Union Jack and they think, oh, that's the like the London flag. And then, you know, they get talking to me and they realize, oh, wait, this guy's from Scotland. And they're saying, oh, is that different from London English, the London accent? And, you know, you think there's, what, 10 million people in London, how many different accents there are. It's somewhat fallacious to think, you know, the American accent or the UA- UK accent, hmm, what do I choose? How many accents are in the US? How many Absolutely. accents are not just like in the UK, but like, let's take Scotland. How many different accents are in Scotland? I'm in Glasgow. How many different, I can think of like three different kind of, I suppose, accents or styles of speaking just from my city. So this idea that students think, oh, I need to sound like, you know, like RP English or something, or this is how they talk in the UK and this is how they talk in America. Unfortunately, it's just not that simple because there's, um, such a variety of uh, different ways of speaking from region to region. Now, uh, just on your last point, you said you were uh, getting so much vocabulary. Now, this is a point a lot of my students make is, for example, I try to elicit for, you know, present perfect, for example, I try to elicit the present perfect for my student and my student is not successfully using the present perfect. So I'll tell the student that, like, or I'll ask the student, you know, how's your knowledge of the present perfect? And they say, I know it. And I'll, I'll be kind of thinking, yeah, but you weren't using it correctly or you weren't using it at all. 
And, you know, when there's really some prime opportunities to use it. And, you know, I might show them a worksheet or something and they say, you know, I know this stuff, but I just can't use it like freely in speech. But, you know, but they know it, but they can't use it. So I guess my sentence, sorry, my question coming back to you is with all of that vocabulary you had learned, you know, what we might call passive vocabulary and learning the sentence structure, what was the process for you of turning that from just passive knowledge to, um, you know, speech that you could actually freely use in conversation? That's a great question. I think one of the first things I did when I realized that there's kind of the process was dysfunctional, that I decided to put perhaps each of these vocabulary, each of each one of these words, I would put it in two or three different sentences. So sure. I get to know the context. The con context is quite important. How do you use it, you know, in different kind of, uh, you know, positions or in different places in a sentence? And I think that was quite, quite crucial for me. And I think, you know, this is something, you know, like the minute you kind of focus on like on one word mm -hmm. and suddenly you start to hear it everywhere. Like when you're reading a newspaper or you, you are listening to a news bulletin or you're watching a movie, you suddenly that word comes you know, across again and again and again until kind of it becomes like kind of embedded, like, you know, ingrained and you kind of, you mastered it. So for me, I think really what kind of worked for me was <clears throat> I ensured that mm -hmm. every word or every vocabulary that I learned, that mm -hmm. at least there are two, three, four, five sentences that I put them in writing and later on also do kind of go and uh, check, you know, my the dictionary to to ensure that you know um, that I'm using it correctly, and perhaps I'll, I'll write a, a, a short paragraph, um, include that, mm -hmm. ensure that that vocabulary is included, share it with friends just to get their feedback, mm -hmm. um, and and I think this was quite beneficial for me. It was really really helpful uh, uh, during the process of learning. So see, just uh, I want to come back to like Arabic and English again, right? The comparison. This is a, a, an interesting point of discussion. So I see this. Uh, <laughs> I see this. I saw this difficulty for me learning Arabic. And I see this difficult, the same difficulty for Arabs trying to learn English. And I'd like to know about your experience of this. I would say to my Arab friends, uh, I met a really nice guy called Karar and he was from Iraq and he was like my primary Arabic teacher. And I would always say to Karar, how do I say uh, I have done this? And he would say to me, that's called present perfect and it doesn't exist in Arabic. And I'd say, look, I don't care about grammar. Just tell me how to say I have done this. <laughs> like, I didn't understand how could this not exist in Arabic? Because this was before I was an English teacher. This was before I knew what present perfect was. I was like, you know, what do you mean? I just want to know how to say I have done this. You know, and I'd, uh, maybe I'd use Google Translate and for like, I have done this, it'd use the verb lede, which is like, you know, I have. Exactly. And it just didn't work, you know. So uh, did you ever have that complication with these tenses? You know, because it wasn't until learning, I suppose, English grammar, so I could become an English teacher. That helped me understand so much about learning Arabic, you know, such as the tenses. I was like, oh, this is the structure of how language is like orchestrated in English. So in Arabic, it has its own way. And I think understanding the grammar of my own language really helped me learn uh, Arabic more. So yeah, I guess for you, was there like, see all of these tenses, was it like difficult to understand? It, before you answer, I just want to say something else, like another comment on that is my native English friends, I will say to them, how many tenses exist in English? And they'll say to me, there's three, there's three tenses, right? Three tenses, past, present, future. I say, no, there's 12. They look at me like, are you serious? There's 12 <laughs> tenses because like in time, you can only go like forwards or backwards. It's not like you can go sideways in time. <laughs> so the idea of even for native English speakers that there's 12 tenses is so like ridiculous. Um, but yeah, for, for you is, I don't know what Kurdish is like. I, I'm guessing Kurdish is similar to Arabic, but going, let's say from Arabic uh, and language, which has three tenses. How did you go from that to like uh, learning English, which has 12? I have to say it was particularly challenging for me with the 
uh, with the uh, present perfect tense. Sure. You know, and like quite similar, like in Arabic, you have to like three main sort of tenses. You've got the present, the past, and the future. Mm -hmm. And it's been really, I mean, during the early days of the journey, it's been kind of mind blowing to go mm -hmm. and then like, you know, like the present, you talk about, you know, the, uh, the, the kind of, uh, the different parts of the present tense yep. you go to yep. the past and the different parts and also the future and the different parts of the future tense mm -hmm. and and it takes you a bit of time <clears throat> until you realize mm -hmm. the importance like you know i mean if you really do not get a good grasp on these different aspects of each tense you really will struggle i sure. mean you know and that's why you sort of it takes a bit of time an effort for you to to kind of uh, get your head around it, but I have to say, no matter how you master it, there will always be something you know you will get it wrong because you still you'd be still thinking in your native mother tongue, no matter what, mm. which which sometimes does not translate into English or vice yeah. versa. <clears throat> um, so I assume this could be something quite similar for an English native mm -hmm. native English speaker trying to learn Arabic and vice versa. Oh yeah, it it really is. I think understanding grammar, like see, when I first started trying to learn Arabic, I thought I could just skip the grammar, um, but later I came to realize how important it was. And when I first actually started teaching, I didn't understand. I didn't even understand as an English teacher. I didn't understand English grammar. I had no idea what, what the system was. Um, so I teach on Preply. And when I, I first started teach, I knew that I wanted to be an English teacher and I had a lot of teaching knowledge, but I didn't have a lot of language teaching knowledge. And the way I kind of learned was I would do classes and I'd tell students, no, you said that wrong. And they might say, why is it wrong? And I wouldn't really know why it was wrong. I just knew that it was wrong. Or I'd say that was wrong. And they'd say, oh, that's supposed to be present perfect right now i'd be like right <laughs> and then i had a wee notebook present perfect what the hell is present perfect and then i had to go and research it and it was kind of through that process uh, i learned the language Definitely. now something now something which is interesting about yourself is you mentioned you were you had your dictionary you'd be traveling you'd be picking up words now, some people ask me this question, and I bet you get this question a lot about like what's the best way to learn a language. And for me, I would say there's not quite a straightforward answer to that because, for example, depending on what you're interested in, depending on what conversations you're going to be having, whether you want to go straight to books or straight to having conversations, there's a lot of, um, I suppose there's a lot of different things to take in account. But I think one of the most important things is just having a goal you know, like I want to be able to read this book or I want to be able to have these kind of conversations or I want to be able to do a job interview. You have the goal and then you think of the language you need and you take kind of incremental steps. So it's not like there's just one such rigid way of going through a language. But I guess uh, the where I'm going with this and the question I want to ask is when people ask you about what's the best way to learn or uh one maybe one of your friends or your followers or to reach out to you and ask you if you had a way of that you thought was particularly a good methodology of uh, learning a language what kind of advice might you offer to someone who asks that question that's a great question i get uh, i mean i you know I, I get quite a lot of questions quite similar to this and people say like you know what is like the magical way of learning english mm -hmm. And I, I almost have to, you know, unfortunately kind of disappoint them. I say like, well, there's no like, you mm -hmm. know, uh, kind of a magical way for you to learn English. You know, they are, it takes time. It takes effort. It needs planning. It needs commitment. Mm -hmm. And I always go back to the same point that if you need to learn English, you need to work on the four skills at the same time. So you need really to dedicate time to each of these four skills, like the, uh, reading, speaking, uh, uh, writing, and listening skills. And mm -hmm. it takes time, 
but the most important thing is that you need to to kind of you need to have plan you need to be committed and the most important thing for me regardless if it's english or a different language or anything in life you need to have passion for it if you do not have passion you need to you 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 are going to struggle so my number one advice to anyone is i always tell them that you know you need to fall in love with what you're doing and the minute you start kind of treating language as as a lover i'm sure you will succeed because you always try to be perfect you you always do your best mm-hmm. to your lover and and treat language something quite similar like that and i and i, and I have to say you know um, i i advise them to work on on these four skills but i also i encourage them um to for example like one of the kind of major challenge that at least some of my the people that i know some of my students was quite a lot of focus on vocabulary and you know kind of indulging themselves with vocabulary without kind of getting to know how to use it in context so i told them like it's really important to get to know the word and how to use it the usage is really important other people focus on grammar and the more they focus the more kind of they kind of lose sight of other aspects of the language the other thing also is some people get sort of lost between formal versus informal slash sure. you know uh, slang so people say like you know about um uh, the way i listen the way i i watch it you know it is different and it's quite challenging for me so i tell them you know you really have to focus on everything it's not like one aspect you need to also be quite competent when it comes to formal but as as well as informal um mm-hmm. the other also which is also a significant part of the language learning journey is uh there are certain communities where people feel quite shy people are quite fearful of sure, making sure. a mistake so making a mistake brings quite a lot of sense of shame to to that individual i always encourage them you do not have to you know feel shy you do not have to fear of making mistakes mistakes mm-hmm. are there for a reason <clears throat> mistakes are there for you to learn mm-hmm. from them. and i told them look in my early days when i was learning english i would have to go you know i used to have like a small uh, uh, uh you know uh, uh kind of a re, uh, kind of recording machine you know like uh, I, I used to use a cassette i used to record myself and hear back I, just to help me improve my speaking as well as kind of uh, kind of evaluate and assess my speaking i also used to stand in front of a mirror and kind of look at myself performing like imagining myself like you know somewhere in hollywood or somewhere in london giving a speech to people mm-hmm. and this helps me quite a lot there will be sometimes what my mum would call me from the next room and she's like hey what's wrong with you are you okay is is, is everything all right you know that's me don't worry about me you know so that's okay you know you you make mistakes this is part of the process and you don't have to uh, worry too much uh, 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 about that um, so these are sure. some sort of the, the key messages that i give to to fellow learners fantastic answer no just just going back right you mentioned passion passion's really important and you know you can see how students with a passion or with a goal they excel faster people think you know if someone said to me once what's the point of setting a goal because you know if you're studying regularly anyway you get there at the same pace honestly people underestimate the power of goal setting now this isn't like goal setting applies in any industry any anything you want to do whether get stronger lose weight uh, gain a degree everything goes smoother when you set goals specifically smart goals specific measurable attainable realistic and most importantly timely you know you put time on it like not just i want to achieve this but i want to achieve this by june you know and for me to achieve it by june we split it up so this month i need to do this and this month i need to do this um one piece of advice i just really strongly um forward to any of the listeners is creating smart goals which are time bound and you know breaking up as to if i want to achieve this this is what i need to get by the end of the month and i find it just it's like you know it just kind of lubricates and makes the whole process smoother faster and better 
But anyway, I'm kind of uh, digressing. To come back to the question I want to ask you is you spoke about the importance of passion. Now, passion is uh, an emotion, you know, motivation, love, anger, happiness. And emotions have their periods where they're strong, and then they have their periods where they kind of uh, fizzle out and uh, die for a period. So how do you keep the passion emotion going, or how do you stimulate that passion when occasionally from time to time it may uh, fizzle out? For me, um, the way it worked was to sort of surround myself with things that I'm quite passionate about. Mm -hmm. So, for example, when it comes to my reading, the um, vast majority of the books were in English, like mm -hmm. English novels um, and, and stories and short stories or magazines. Mm -hmm. When it comes to my music, you know, some of my best musicians, mm -hmm. kind of, you know, singers, all in English. When it comes to my movies, again, um, you know, we're all kind of in English language. And even when it came to my um, social media at that time, most of my social media, uh, Facebook at that time and, and, and Twitter, all in English. So that helped me massively. This helped me, you know, kind of improve. This helped me kind of be, be kind of, you know, um, kind of on top of things when it comes to learning. But the other thing also, you need encouragement because I remember I was a student um, during um, the, you know, the, the secondary school and I used to get quite a lot of praise from my teacher because during the exams, all students will have kind of a, a, an exam, an examination kind of paper form. I was the only person who would have a different examination form because their expectations of me was much higher because I've, I've put wow. quite a lot of effort. So that put me in a position that, you know, they've got an expectation. I need to work harder on myself to achieve that. And I think that gave me uh, a, 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 a great push when it comes to learning. Amazing answer. Um, I just have a couple of wrap-up questions for you, a couple of shorter, easier questions. I say easier. <laughs> My other uh, podcast guests always struggle with these questions. Now, um, first one, what is your favorite book that you have read? That is a great question. There are quite a lot of ones. Um, oh, oh my, it's really hard to know it down to one. Um, uh, but I have to say, um, I'm very much into political uh, uh, novels and mm -hmm. my favorite is 1984 yeah exactly. George Orwell it's funny I was talking about that book with a student today it is my favorite book did you read it in English I I've I've read it several times in English I've read it once in Arabic but uh, the experience in in English it was fantastic. It's really the it it get lost basically in translation. So yes, uh, I read it several times in uh, in uh, in English. I have to say, I tried reading 1984. I tried reading. It. I'm not as you know, despite all the books behind me, I'm not really a great reader. And uh, like I love learning, and I think 1984 is a gem with amazing information in it. But I found 1984 to be a really difficult read. I mean, to be honest, it is, it's, a, it's a piece of cake compared to uh, some of the books that are like Dubliners, mm -hmm. you know, by James Joyce, or a portrait of a, you know, uh, an artist as a young man, or some of the early, early, like, you know, when I was in Syria, the early days, like I, I was using, like, uh, I used to read um, uh, Country Tales mm -hmm. by Chaucer. And if you compare 19... 84 to these ones this is just sure. nothing this is you know an absolute like you know a, a, a breeze like a walk in the park compared to these ones <laughs> you've had a bunch of excellent idioms today and you know i hope uh, the learners who are watching this they have their notepads and they're writing down your idioms i've heard you say uh, i think i heard you say wrap your head around it walk in the park uh, a breeze you know you've got some excellent idioms there um so an another one for you right oh in fact before i move on uh, another show from George Orwell is Animal Farm. Have you ever read that? 
This is one of the, yeah, this is one of the early books that I read in English literature. In fact, it was a requirement in the early, like as a freshman, it was a, it was a requirement. So um, I read that 19, uh, sorry, Animals Farm. It was, uh, it, it was an eye opener for me. Yeah, sure. Sure. Okay. Next question. What's a piece of advice you've been given that you never forgot? The one great piece of advice that I've got that I, I will never forget is that learning never stops. You have to keep learning. You can't say I mastered this or that. The minute you stop, you know there's something wrong. Great piece of advice, that's amazing. Uh, the last question, which is an easier one, is where can people find you? Right. Uh, yeah, there are several ways that people can find me. Mm -hmm. So if you Google um, British English Plus, hopefully you will come across my YouTube channel or my TikTok or my Instagram. And, and this is where you'll be able to find my contact details. and. Uh, get in touch if there's anything I could help with please feel free to drop me a line great I'm gonna include all of your links so people can subscribe to your pages um, I think everyone can benefit from watching your content your content is absolutely awesome I'm using your content to learn to polish my Arabic but I think you know for the English language learners out there they can definitely uh, t take advantage of following you on social media and benefiting from your awesome content it makes me, um, you know, I'm, I'm delighted. I'm so pleased to, to hear so. And this even makes me so determined now to sort of, because, you know, if you look at my videos, mostly they are written Arabic, not spoken Arabic. So I try kind of to speak in English uh, and also have the subtitles in Arabic. But perhaps I need to reconsider and try to pronounce kind of, you know, do Arabic, English, both pronunciation at the same time. So this perhaps would help other learners as well. Yeah, I mean, maybe it's uh, something to consider for the future is you could do Arabic learning content. Maybe people would be interested. I mean, see your audience, like you, ab like from watching your videos, you absolutely deserve all of the fame that you have got, the abundance of fame that you've gotten over the last uh, year or two years because your content is awesome. And it's, I can see from the comments, I can see it's clearly helping people. So maybe I wouldn't suggest changing too much because whatever you're doing is working if people like it. But, you know, I, I encourage you to keep it up and I wish you nothing but success for the future. And hopefully, if you like, we can do another one of these again sometime. Absolutely. It'd be my absolute pleasure. Great. So I just encourage everyone to follow the links. But thanks again for coming on today. It's my pleasure. Thank you very much for having me.